uh, ask any Ukrainian. And so I wonder if, given your own commitments in the final pages of the book to liberal democracy, um, that might make for more common ground on which to work. In conclusion, I'm grateful for your work and I'm so glad you're here at Regent to present it. Thanks for hearing these thoughts and look forward to your engagement as we go on. Thank you very much, David, for the customary, very thoughtful and uh, thought-provoking response. Thanks for that. Um, I want to give Paul a chance to respond, if you would like. And uh, then we will use these two microphones for your questions. You can make your way there or can line up there if you want. And I'm just going to say um, real quickly, please ask a question. We, we don't need a live story or a long commentary. But if you have a succinct question to ask, please feel free and line up to one of the microphones and then we'll moderate that after your response. David, thank you. Uh, great response. Lots of good points of pushback. I want to leave room for the, the bigger conversation, so I'll try to be brief. Um, I probably won't respond to all your points, but starting with the last one, if I'm following the, the, the concern um, correctly, you're questioning the, the value or the utility or the, the, maybe the prudence of labeling um, some of these recent uh, moral scientists as nihilists, moral nihilists. I think I understand the concern. I, I guess I just take a different view in that I, I, what I'm very aware of is the potential harm for thinkers who are presenting themselves as though they're telling us how morality works and they're giving a, re a re very reductive materialist account of it um, without signaling that they've changed the subject, that they're actually not talking about morality. And I, I just think that is, uh, I don't think it's intentional in most cases. I think it is in some cases, but we don't, we don't say that in the book, just in interaction with these people. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's very important for it to be clear to us when these thinkers are not really talking about good and bad and right and wrong, when they're talking about uh, the achievement of goals, or when they're talking about something that can be adequately reduced to neurochemistry or something like, something like that. Because otherwise, if it's not clear, I think it would be easy for us to come away from reading their, their, their books, their articles, and think, oh, they, we, we've done it. They've, they've explained what morality really is, and it's you know, the release of serotonin and oxytocin and you know, these things. And that would be a, a terrible misunderstanding. And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure there are grave implications for liberal democracy. I think those are probably more deeply rooted in their view than their views about morality. Uh, but I'm open to persuasion on that point. Just real quickly on some of your other points, all of which are very thought provoking. Um, the one that I will think about the most I know going forward is your, your, what you said here and what he also told me over dinner. Uh, you were nicer here than you were then, so I appreciate that. Uh, but the good points in both, both cases. That, you know, Paul, you know, he's saying, there are plenty of scientists who, who do see and appreciate the good of the whole organism. And he gave the example of Wilson and numerous others. And this often, often shows up, he's absolutely right, in conservation work. When scientists and associated institutions say, look, um, for something that's close to my heart is uh, the eastern indigo snake. Most people don't like snakes, but this is the most glorious Native American snake. It's the longest snake that's native to the United States, where I live. Uh, they can be eight and a half feet long. They're glossy black. They have this iridescent sheen to their black scales. They're beautiful. They're very docile. You can pick up an eight-foot indigo snake off the ground, and it won't bite you. That's partly why they're endangered, <laughs> because they're easy to kill, because they don't fight back. Uh, they also eat rattlesnakes. They eat venomous snakes. They're glorious, but they're, they're almost extinct. And, but in the, in the attempts for institutions to promote the preservation of these species, they draw on our ability to access and understand the, the goods, the unique goods of these, of these organisms. And David's absolutely right that many scientists engage in this. And I'll, I'll stop with this final point because I'm, I'm just talking too much. What I'm trying to say, and I think, that, I think your point is a good one, what I'm trying to say is, yeah, I would say yes, many scientists do appreciate this because scientists are also human beings. 
you know, I'm saying the properly scientific instrument for appreciating what living organisms are is the human being because we're the only things that can detect the unique good of each organism and that's our clue to the, to the true identity and essence of them. Scientists are the same way. And so they are able to access the, the glorious wonder of the eastern indigo snake just like, just like I am. Um, but when they do it, and here's my, my point, they're not engaging in empirical science. They're, they're engaging as a human being who has a goodness detector like we all do, which is good and I think they should do that. And, and, and really in a way, insofar as they are doing that, I see that as a step in the right direction. I, I, I applaud that because they are drawing on something that goes beyond the merely empirical, they go beyond the mechanical underlying qualities, they draw our attention to these unique goods. Uh, and I think I would just say in these cases, I, I think it would help for us to realize, oh, it, they, they're doing this, but in, in so doing, this is no longer an empirical approach. They're engaging in this sort of broader true science as I was, I guess, kind of optimistically calling it. Um, I have a lot more I want to say about the, the natural evil stuff, but I'll, I'll stop there and maybe it'll come up in, in, uh, in discussion. I think we should both come up, don't you think? Yep. Okay. I can, stand over, I can stand over here and you can stand at the, the mic because I have this right. mobile unit. Okay, please, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, begin. Noah, you're just gonna start? Okay. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. I was just saying to John, I enjoyed it. I don't know if I agree with it, and that's part of why I enjoyed it. I just, I have no idea. Um, but I, I wanted to ask a question um, based on a class that I actually took with David Robinson a couple years ago. Where it was a class on science and theology, and we talked in that class about how um, the basis of Christian metaphysics was, was part of what enabled the scientific revolution, and part of the, the um, part of the basis there, I was, um, it seems like a, an interest in discovering these primary qualities to explain the phenomenology that, that, that you said was, was the point, it seems like that's the driver that sort of pulled natural sciences out of natural philosophy into its own field in some ways. And I was curious how, how proponents of a scientifically based morality today respond to that historical case. Um, is it, is it something that they they dismiss, or has it just been lost from from the tradition? You mean um, how they respond to the kind of uh, Christian origins of? The yeah, of the yeah. I mean, I came into the talk and I was like, well, it kind of seems like you can't base science in you can't base morality in science, but it seems like at least our Western con concept of science is grounded in a Christian metaphysics that would presume morality. That's an interesting thought. I, I'm not sure what I think about that. Um, I know that I, I, I've heard of the argument that you're referring to. I frankly don't know much about the case for the, the Christian, Christian origins of, of science. Uh, it, I mean, it, historically, the, the timelines work out. That's what it was arising out of. Most of the founders of science were, were Christians. Um, but in terms of like internal, I mean, maybe, maybe really general things like acceptance of the intelligibility and orderliness of nature. I think something like that would be a part of it. My guess would be the new moral scientists, if this is drawn, drawn to their attention, I'm not sure what they would say. I mean, I think they, they would find it to be coincidental. Uh, and whatever the origins, we've refined it since then, and it's, it's not appreciably Christian anymore. I, I'm, that's just a guess, though. It's a good question. If you have a, you may have a good answer to this, David. I don't. I don't. I'm not very well read in the moral scientists, so I can't speak to what they would say. But I do know that um, when you get the rise of institutions um, like the Royal Society and others, you, you, you're in a period um, where religious institutions provided a kind of legitimacy to scientific inquiry, and that was important in that cultural moment, um, whereas now that balance has shifted significantly, right? And so, it, if anything, science might be explaining religion, right, and giving it a kind of legitimacy through its own account, and that may be where some of the moral scientists might might operate. Okay, I'll take next. I don't know who was first. Ken, can I I'll go to you? Oh, sure. And then... Uh, See you after. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much for this provocative lecture. I very much enjoyed it. Uh, you make a fairly strong distinction between the empirical science that mm -hmm. is done by any given scientist and that scientist's moral compass. And I like that. I think that makes perfect sense. But doesn't that bring into question, and fundamentally so, uh, what we kind of um, rely on quite a bit, and that is expert uh, testimony, expert advice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the whole idea of follow the science, when you're basically saying, well, you know what, that science could be done this way by somebody whose moral compass is completely, you know, distinct. And uh, I, I just wonder if you'd like to rip off of that, uh, that what I think is something of a logical consequence of your, uh, your distinction between scientific practice and morality. Yeah, so in my response, if you think I've misunderstood your question, just stop me and, and I'll and, and clarify. But um, I take a part of the concern is if, if I'm right, um, how can we trust the experts? How can we trust the scientists if their, their, their moral sensibilities have really nothing to do with their empirical, you know, acumen. Um, my, my thought would be, we've, cre we've created an institutional structure where there are a lot of norms and procedures for how we decide if, a, you know, a, a scientific uh, hypothesis has been confirmed or not. You know, I'm thinking about people have a lot of complaints with the American, you know, pharmaceutical industrial complex, but there there are certain rig rigorous protocols that have to be met, and these kinds of protocols, these kinds of um, standards of, for success and failure, the fact that they're in place, I think, mitigates this. I think you can be, you know, you can be. I, I, by the way, I don't think scientists are evil people. I think they're no. they're just like us. But th if even if they were even if they were, these kinds of, of safeguards would make it so that it didn't matter as much because you can, if, if you were the hypothetical evil scientist, uh, you, you would still have to have the drug been tested in some way and then it would either work or it wouldn't, to, you know, to some degree. And so that, I think that kind of institutional context could help a little bit. Is that, is that getting it? Uh, it, it gets at it. But the idea is that <coughs> science uh, is a method. It's, it's, it's a process that's fairly uh, understandable and uh, one's moral sense is on, an, on a different order of human faculties. And so when a scientist or, you know, say Paul Krugman, an economist at the New York Times, oh, he's got a Nobel Prize in uh, economics, uh, he must know something. Well, I'm sure he, not, he knows an awful lot but I'm not so sure that his conclusions that he brings to the public realm necessarily uh, should be looked upon as uh, more authoritative, given that th there are two faculties involved in this, you know, within the human being that we're talking about. Yeah, especially if he's, especially if the, uh, the experts is bleeding over into sort of practical recommendations. Well, here's what you ought to do. Yeah, yeah no, I, I actually totally agree with that. Um, to me, when you move from here's what we observed and here's how we tested it and this is why we think this is the most plausible explanation for this phenomenon, when you move from that to, and because of this, here's how you should live your life. You know, that, then you've, you've, you've at least strayed out of the empirical realm uh, into the moral realm and there, I think there are experts that are hard to identify probably have to know them personally. <laughs> That's my view. <laughs> yeah, thank you, David. Did you want to add anything? Well, just the Paul, it's interesting because here is where I hear you in the science and the good mode, but in your second part mode, it seems like you'd want to actually see more of a unity between those two faculties. Is that, would that be fair? I think uh, the you ultimate see the, goal. You see the moral and the, the empirical working much more in close concert rather than being demarcated in the way that you're, you're doing it in science and the good. Yes, I mean, I, I, if my, you want to call it a career, is about anything, it's about pushing for the, the reunification mm -hmm. of the disciplines, the, the unity of all knowledge together, it all hangs together. Um, I still think that uh, there are differences, mm -hmm. 
different kinds of knowledge. There's, there's still a genuine distinction between things that are, are sort of demonstratively empirical and things that aren't. And because of that, the implications are sometimes different. I think you can have someone who's an expert, you know, like about, especially about empirical things, because they can, in principle, demonstrate why they're saying something to be the case in ways that you could, you could accept. And it, unlike accepting so, someone's expertise on the basis of their, of their alleged religious experience. You know, that's just a dicier proposition. They can't show you, like, well, no, the angel said this, and it's, it's the fifth gospel. See, I wrote it down. You know, um, so I, I, I don't know if this helps, um, but I, I think, you know, the goal is the unification of all systems of knowledge, but I still think there is room within that. There are some kinds of things that lend themselves to impartial expertise and some that, that do not. And that's where I see, I said this to you at dinner, this is where I see you in Science of the Good tracking this phenomenon of moral scientists who are claiming more than they can from the empirical science, right? But that very urge to do so is in a way um, showing what it is that you'd like to see done. You'd just like to see it done with more ethical, philosophical rigor and accountability and so forth that's and, a, and transparency. That's a very generous comment. Yeah, I, if, the, if the new moral scientists had did all the stuff that they did and they, and they, and they I guess there's two things. One, they didn't claim that th what they were saying about morality was a result of a purely empirical method. They didn't do that. And if they instead said, look, all, all knowledge is connected ultimately, and what we're doing has an empirical component and it has uh, an interpretive component and it has a philosophical component, and here's the overall package and here's why we think it's the one you should, then I, I'd be like, well done, you know? Where do I sign up for this, this methodology? I mean, isn't that why you need interdisciplinarity, right? I you, think so. So, I mean, I, I'm listening to this conversation, I'm thinking, you know, are we not expecting too much of science? You pointed out the limits. The way that science is constructed in its empirical, mathematically quantifiable <laughs> version of classical physics, let's say, gets at mathematical objectifying uh, that part of the world that we see that way. There's another part of the world that that way of putting things together cannot grasp, which is processes, which is the organic, which is life, like a whole organism. Aristotle had equipment for that process, right? The telos. And yet there's a third element, which is the personalist, ultimately our human moral dimension and so on. So why would you expect the economist to, to be able to say something like that unless he draws it in? So I'm looking at our chair of the art sitting there. I think this is where you need poetry, where you need literature, where you need, you know, these kind of dimensions of, of the, of, of sciencia, of knowledge, which is, which we have sidelined because that particular mathematizing, like the paradigm you showed from Galileo, Descartes, and so on, has only focused on that and made it universal. And you've pointed out the limitations of that, but that's all it can do. Like, you shouldn't expect more of it. Then we have a process way, Aristotle, you bring that back in, and then I think we need the kind of thing that literature and the arts can portray, you know, the beauty of things that is inherent in them, but that that particular method, and even the second one, can't quite see. So it, it, our problem is, I think, we've relegated the arts, because of that particular first paradigm, to, to uh, non-knowledge. It's not real knowledge, it's just opinion, it's just subjective, but it's actually real. I think that's right, and I think a lot <laughs> so. of that is this enduring legacy of I really think the, the legacy of the wars of religion still hangs over us, even if we had never heard of them. Because it's, it's entered into the culture where uh, if you make a claim about something, especially about something significant, and you're not able, as, as my friends like to say, like if somebody makes a bold claim, somebody will say, prove it. You know, it's kind of in jest. But I think that's, that's part of our, our dialectical legacy because in some cases that really sort of scarred us, if there's such a thing as cultural trauma, maybe the wars of religion or that, but you know, there's a sense that if you were gonna make a bold claim, you need to be able to prove it. Uh, and I think that's, it would be nice if we could, but that's, that's a tragic loss because I mean, the religious language is particularly that language can speak about the reality of morality and right. of beauty and of, you know, yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna go to Sean, sorry. Hiya, uh, <coughs> Hiya thanks for the, um, fascinating talk. Um, I, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, um, what I'm hearing is that your suggestion for the path forward um, is um, that not only, I mean, away from this kind of uh, a scientist telling us about everything, but also them recognizing that they, their scope of 
um, understanding is very limited, and they, we um, scientists need, need, need to hear from like philosophers and theologians and from the humanities scholars. Um, so my question is, um, I and I, I like that, like kind of um, bringing more, um, um, restoring the unity between these fields, but. Um, um, if you actually kind of look at the history of science, like, you know, like the ancient um, natural philosophers, they didn't seem to have this kind of distinction between like a pure empirical approach to studying na nature. I, I mean, like if you read like Aristotle, then the way he does science is um, philosophical and it is oriented towards finding its proper talents and the good. Um, so I, I'm, I am wondering, um, do you also see a path forward for science itself from, uh, for it to free itself from kind of a narrow um, boundaries of empiricism and kind of restoring that kind of a more holistic vision of, I mean, I mean, th that was not just ancient scientists, right? Even like the medieval natural philosophers um, thought about all creation. When they were studying creation that, um, that way, they thought about the telos, they thought about the moral implications, theological implications. So. Um, yeah, do you see a path for, for science itself? Maybe, I mean, I think, I think it can be, because it's not so closely oriented toward utility, there, there, there for instance, wouldn't be nearly as much of a, an interest by by business, by people who are trying to make money from capitalist enterprise for the kind of science that I'm talking about. But that's not the only source of money. I mean, the liberal arts still exist. The study of theology still exists. And these have, you know, evanescent connections to, to you know, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, and we're able to fund those. So I think, I think it could exist, in, you know, in sort of small incubator type situations, like in, in colleges and universities, where there was an interest in a more expansive conception of science. I don't think it could ever, absent some kind of like hard to imagine cultural shift, displace what we have now, um, just because the incentives, the incentives aren't, aren't there. But I, I feel out of my depth talking about whether this would work. Well, the most I can hope to accomplish this is, I think this, this would be a better way to go, but will we? I, I doubt it, but I don't know. <laughs> David, do you have thoughts on? Just that I would say, I would see it as significantly up to the scientists to make that move. So um, I, as a theologian, I wouldn't want to speak to that specifically. Um, hmm. And I'm happy with the current arrangement of the disciplines and trying to foster better engagements between them, but not, not planning to speak into what science should become or ought to become. I think that's for scientists themselves to, to sort through. Well, what about when they, when they step on our terrain? Well, then you, you tell them. You turn the other cheek. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, you critically engage, absolutely. But um, I think that, uh, you know, it's something that I, I respect the integrity of, of science. And I, I think that I don't, I don't think we need to go back to a theology as queen of the sciences uh, hmm. model. <coughs> I think we do. Um, next question. <laughs> <laughs> we have a number of people lined up, so um, please keep going. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a quick one to clarify uh, something in my mind. Um, so if, if it is true that, like, that, that we have a faculty for investigating the good and discovering it and finding it in the world, is it not then, and, and we come to a belief that we have that faculty through our experiences of the world and everything available to us, right? Uh, is that surely that faculty exists within a materialist understanding of the world, right? And so then is that, does that not then become an avenue for them to empirically discover the good and draw that out of the world? That's, wh that's what they've been trying to do. Um, then, then, then I guess, uh, what, is, what is the difference between their understanding of what the good is that makes that unavailable to them? And, available, and unavailable to a materialist, but available to somebody with, I guess, yeah, wh whatever additional faculty uh, makes it 
makes that functional in a spiritual context. Yeah. Um, so it is definitely, you're certainly right. There's a material component. An example that one of my professors made in grad school that's always stuck with me is like, we know the mind and the brain are connected because if you hit somebody in the brain hard enough with a hammer, it will affect their mental activity. Uh, wow, that's graphic, but got the point across. Um, the trouble is that, so we know there's like this causal interrelationship, but try, attempting to study the brain from the physical angle has not thus far proved very illuminating for our moral, our moral faculties. And it's been, they, they, we've been working on it, you know, we as, as you know, Western, Western scientific society for, for a long time, and we just haven't been able to pin down anything. And James Hunter's, in my observation, would be, I think, that if you think about moral phenomena, again, it's not empirically provable, so you just have to kind of think about, well, do I understand the concept? You know, goodness, if you think about the goodness of something, how is that located in the object? How could that arise from its atoms, from the working of its parts? It's, it's, you can't really trace that out, but you can still detect it. Um, when do we have an obligation to someone? Here's another moral element. Uh, that seems to arise from certain kinds of relationships that are very difficult to trace back to material basis. Even like your obligations to your kids, there's often a genetic basis, but like my kids are adopted. There's like no genetic connection uh, other than we're human beings. Um, but I still have an obligation to care for them. They're just, there's all kinds of these, these troubling counterexamples that arise when we attempt to, to, to give a material account of, of the moral realm. And so then the question is, we have material stuff here, there's immaterial, immaterial stuff out here, there's a connection somehow, but then we keep running into the problem of how do you explore the connection when you can't measure one half of the relationship? Does that help? Like, you can sort of get an empirical hold on the mind meat, the, you know, the brain stuff, but you can't get an empirical hold on the moral phenomena. Um, we, we also can't with rationality or, you know, so many aspects of, of mentality. Well, it seems like you should be able to get some kind of, uh, like, an indirect connection to those things. You can, you can explore the, like, like if you talk about, I, like, I mean, a lot of times when people describe, I see the good in this thing, it's just, like, like what's actually happening, it's just a positive emotion in response to a particular state of, a, like, maybe, maybe, God, maybe God knows what the good actually is, right? But I don't have, you know, I, full, I, full access to that. Right? You don't have full access, and neither do I. But I would say, I would just encourage you that, because sometimes you will see something and you'll think, that's amazing. You know, sure, the sunset happens every day. You don't see them as often, often here in Vancouver, unfortunately. But, you know, sometimes you do, and you're like, wow, that's, it happens every night, but somehow I'm still impressed. <laughs> um, you know, uh, in that case, I would just submit to you to, to, to ponder, like, maybe I'm actually tracking real objective feature of the world. Maybe it really, maybe it seems and feels glorious because it is. Uh, uh, and we don't know how that marries up with your brain, but that's okay. okay. I'm going to, I'm looking at the time, Sorry. so I'll, you can go, you can keep the conversation going um, afterwards. David, are you okay if I go to the next question? We have at least two more from what I can see, so. I don't think it was defined in the, this talk either. And then specifically too, how does it fit in with uh, David's point on uh, the nature, of the evils within nature itself that you want to talk about? Thank you. Give me a chance to make some responses that I, I didn't. <laughs> I don't want to define nature because it's too hard. Um, I, 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 I'm using it. I'm using it roughly uh, synonymously for, with creation. Of course, in ordinary dialogue, that's not that's not close enough because, on that account, I mean, angels are created. You know, uh, they're not something that we would say are a part of the, the the study of the natural world. So maybe maybe just for practical purposes. I think you can think of nature as I'm using the term as something like um, non-supernatural aspects of the non-supernatural part of creation. That kind of narrows it in a bit. The natural evil stuff.
I, to, to me, it's one of the most interesting questions. I, I, because what I'm proposing is you know, what I'm calling the true science doesn't exist. It's something that I'm just calling for. Not a lot of research has been done on it, unsurprisingly. And so I, I don't feel too worried that all of the questions um, st have not been answered by the new true science that I'm talking about because, I mean, the other science has had hundreds, if not millions, of researchers working on it for 400 years. It's an unfair comparison. Uh, we'll get there. But I, I would just say this. I, I don't think that the apparent evils of creation call into question the reality of the goods. I mean, an, an analogy that I like when talking about these things is it's, it's sort of riffing on the famous, like, Paley's watch uh, anecdote, but I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction. If you're like walking around in the woods and you find inexplicably this painting and the painting is beautifully done, you know, it's maybe like this painting of like a woman on a horse, let's say, but one, one like quadrant of the painting is really messed up and you can't tell like, what, did it get smeared? Did the artist have a psychotic break? You're not sure, like just, but, but the other part of the painting is beautiful. I think, what, I think what you should infer is whoever made this painting, at least, you know, whoever, wh whatever person, whatever group of persons made this painting, there was genuine skill and artistry and goodness involved for at least part of it. That, that's the good part of the painting. What happened down here, Paul? I don't know, maybe there was a second painter Maybe something happened to the, the first painter, but, but I think the evident beautiful qualities in what does persist in the painting is enough to say there was goodness that went into this painting because it's there it's, and it's, it's impossible to explain any other way. And that's, I think, one way to think about creation. We see the goodness in the indigo snake. I guess that's kind of a, a big lift for most people. You see the goodness in an eagle, um, in a whale. And I think you can recognize that goodness even while, even while you might see a hagfish. And, and it, you know, it's harder to understand. For a fun time, when you get home, search Google Images for hagfish, hagfish face. It's, it's a thrill ride. Um, hard to see the good there. So I don't, I don't have an answer for why it's there, but I don't think it calls into question the genuine goods in creation. Okay, uh, do we have two more questions, am I, am I right? Can I ask you in respect of time for both of you to ask your questions and are you okay with that? And then sure. to respond, mm -hmm. because then we can stay within the time limit roughly. Okay, thank you. Great, uh, yeah, thanks for the, that was amazing. Uh, so, uh, I'll talk back quick again. A renewed and expanded uh, Christology or theology that incorporates and speaks to the scientific and philosophic developments over the last 400 years be reintegrated and recentered into the core of our elite Western educational institutions, or should we start over, or you know, create new ones, or both? Like, what should we do, if, I, if I'm right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, this is the moment in history when it gets decided, so you okay. better be on it. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Uh, really inspiring to think of ourselves as instruments designed to um, take in the good and discover the good. Um, I, I'm curious in terms of you think of the, the purpose of the telos of um, different um, uh, organisms and parts of creation. Um, how broadly do you think of that? Like, do you think of it that the good rests in an individual or in a family unit? Some people would say, you know, a whole nation has a specific purpose um, or there's a good about a whole nation. How do you think about those different levels? Um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear how broad that picture is. Thanks. Another, another generous question, letting me respond to something else that David brought up. Um, so I'll start with you, and then I'll go to the um, changing the scientific world from here on out. Uh, yeah, in my talk, I was focusing on the, the contributed, like, peculi peculiar good that is made by each organism. And I think David was right, to, to absolutely right to say, surely that's not the only place it shows up. Um, think about how these organisms wor work together. Uh, and I, I, think that's exact, I think that's exactly right. I think there, there's also a good of the, ho of the whole cosmos when it, in the way it's supposed to fit together and function. Uh, if, we're, if we believe that God, in the beginning God created, there was a des design and a plan for how things would fit together. And 
Um, now, of course, like the painting analogy, something happened, and so you know, there's more to the story, but I do think the goodness can, we can see aspects of the goodness in the organisms, and the reason I say that is because each of us can do it and does do it all the time, but I also think that there is a more difficult to articulate way in which organisms fit together into a coherent whole. And this is a place where the scientists, I think, have something to contribute that it's gonna be much more difficult for, for the average layperson to make a contribution on. Just because, you know, I, I may watch my cat and I may watch the dark-eyed juncos eating at my bird feeder, but I don't have enough experience and observation and understanding how they live together to, to have a sense of this overall picture. Um, so hopefully that helps a little bit. I, my, my main thing is just to say, because goodness is not empirical, I think we should recognize it doesn't come from empirical expertise. And that's just an interesting thing to think about. Where do we go from here? How do we change things? I don't know. I mean, I, I think uh, the kind of academic that I am is I, I think about definitions and I think about how did we get here? And I almost never think about how do we make it all better? That's, a, that's, that's at least as important. Yeah, I think you need the diagnosis and you need the remedy. And I'm working on the diagnosis. And if you have some thoughts on how to reverse course and bring the, the true science of nature to existence, let me know. But I, David or Jens might have some thoughts, but I, not me. Yeah, we've got lots of thoughts, sorry, but uh, we're out of time, so I'll hide behind the, uh, the time limit. I want to thank you both for coming and being here. Thank you for your questions. Maybe we can just give these two uh, you know, a round of applause. Thank you very much. And, and the question as to where we go from here is, is quite simple. You go straight to the pub and keep talking. <laughs> And uh, the other question, the other point is, if you want more of these kind of things, I believe it's March 26, but you can check our webpage, houstoncenter.org, for the next talk on technology and society with uh, Andrew Feenberg from SFU, who's a philosopher of technology, who will speak on technology and human flourishing. And again, we'll have a couple of respondents. So please uh, check our webpage and come back for that if you can. Thank you for coming out and have a safe trip home. Thank you.